probable cause is a thing. John Pryor is a moron, and Ian Pulaski may have broken this whole case wide open. That and a whole lot more as we go into more of the Daybell trial, this time days 16 and 17. Welcome to True Crime Faith and Chocolate. I am your host, and hell I am, USA Today bestselling author of Just One More, the suspense novel, and a whole bunch of other stuff. I am also a woman of faith, member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so I can offer some insights into especially the Daybell case that others are not covering. And I am a true crime junkie. That's why we're here. I did cover Heather Daybell's testimony in my last video. I, I just had to jump in and talk about her because it was just... She's a hero. She's a hero, and if people had just listened to her when she first spoke up, we might have avoided all of this chaos. Go back and watch that. I'll make sure to link to it somewhere up here so you can go watch that. Um, but for the rest of the day 16 and 17, um, let's dive right in. Friday, May 3rd began as we finished up with the testimony of David Stubb. He is the one that was in charge of the geofence, the Google accounts, and a lot of the, the digital evidence involved in this case. You can go back and listen to a lot of that yourself. A lot of it is pretty dry, but very important uh, for putting people at the scene when things happened and connecting accounts and all that fun stuff. Um, it's very damning evidence. One thing that really pissed me off, however, <laughs> in that whole, in his testimony, there's so many things in this case that do, let's, let's be frank, right? But they found a thumb drive that had a bunch of photographs from Chad and Lori's Hawaii beach wedding, right? To be expected, that that's not unusual. The problem is that they ran their forensic software on this thumb drive and they discovered that what had been previously on that thumb drive and deleted was essentially the Daybill family photo album evidence of Chad and Tammy's courtship and their wedding, their children being born and their childhood, poof, gone. That just, just me? Is it just me or does that just feel just a, another level of skeevy? Just, let's just erase them. Let's pretend it didn't happen. No, that just pisses me off. The townhomes that Lori and Alex were renting, we saw body cam when the police officers tried to serve the warrant and they had fled. And this was the day, I believe, after the welfare check, which where, of course, the police already knew that Chad and Lori were married, but Lori pretended, oh yeah, that guy named Chad, my brother's friend. I don't have his number, but yeah, what a lot of crap. Um, they, so they served this warrant, no one was home, broke in the doors, and there's body cam as he walks through and he's discussing everything he sees. In Alex's apartment, lots of weapons, all kinds of weapons from, weird swords to just all kinds of guns. So that's creepy. Pryor talked to Detective Stubbs about the welfare check. Why didn't you know, they arrest Alex and Lori then, blah, blah, blah. The cops knew she was lying. They already knew she was married to Chad and she's lying through her teeth. At this point, the children are missing. They don't know if the, the children are actually buried in Chad's backyard. This is a missing children's case. As such, they have only specific things as law enforcement that they can do at any given time. Probable cause, like I said at the beginning, they couldn't have detained them yet. They needed evidence of various whatever things before you can charge someone and then hold them. That's the law. Prior on Cross was just going off about, well, why didn't you arrest them? Why didn't you this, that, and the other? And We've heard the recording, the audio, but we got to see the, the body cam of when they actually were talking to Lori in her townhouse. Referring to that moment, Pryor says, well, Lori was pretty convincing then, wasn't she? And Stubbs just said, no. <laughs> Pryor goes, oh, she wasn't? And you're like, dude, cops are very good at having a poker face, at saying the right things, of de-escalating or keeping things from escalating. They're trained well anyway. And apparently, Stubbs or or one of the officers with him had seen a shadow on the stairway that they were pretty sure was Alex and they knew Alex had weapons. You don't want to escalate that kind of situation. You're putting yourself and others at risk. 
And you can't arrest Lori right now anyway. For what? We're looking. We need evidence. So that was hilarious when he says, oh, Lori was pretty convincing. No. No. <laughs> just, the cops, they, they, they can hold, keep their, their cards to the vest. They, they know how to do that. Then we had uh, Special Agent Steve Daniels from the FBI. And he was the one that was in charge of the whole dig where they recovered the children's bodies on Chad, in Chad's backyard. So he talked about strategizing in advance, looking at aerial photos of the property, guessing where they, they might be able to find graves, like where the ground had been disturbed, that kind of thing. They'd heard from a friend or a cousin involved that there was this pet cemetery and that perhaps that there would be something around there. Pryor went off on his own cross later about, well, who was in charge of this particular meeting? And Daniel said, it wasn't me. I'm not sure who was in charge. Well, at this particular moment, did you do this? And he's like, I don't recall that. Well, what did you recall if it's such an important case? And he's, and basically he says, I reviewed my notes. I would have to re review them about that specific moment, but I was reviewing the actual excavation process. And I do hundreds of these cases. So I did not review that exact moment. No. And, <laughs> ha. Get a clue, Briar. I know he, he's trying to establish some doubt, but he's doing it in ways that just make him look stupid. <laughs> Special Agent Daniels went into how he they conduct the process of, you know, they go through, everybody has their job and they go through very methodically. They secure the site so people can't come in and out. Something else Pryor tried to bring up of, oh, how many people were there at any given time? And he said, well, we had the logs that everyone who signed in and signed out over the course of these two days, it was X amount of people. I don't know how many in any given hour I would have to look at look that up or whatever and prior jumped at that as if record keeping was a bad thing whatever they went through the whole process of slowly digging through using a backhoe at this point and switching to shovels and other small tools we know they found jj's body first i'm jumping to where special agent daniels was talking about discovering tylee's remains and at first in the pet cemetery area they found dog and cat remains which you would expect for being in the pet cemetery area. And they kept digging and then they found what looked like a human vertebra. But they couldn't be positive, just looking at it. They slowed down at this point thinking, okay, we were probably close to what we're looking for. They dug just a little bit deeper and then the smell of human decomposition wafted out. And he, you know, as you probably heard from him and many other law enforcement people, if you have smelled that smell, you know it immediately when you smell it again. And they thought, okay, we have found it. We know there is, there are human remains here, so they slowed down. And as we know from other testimony from Lori's trial as well, they had to rotate every few minutes because the cell smell was so overwhelming that one person couldn't work there for very long. So they had to rotate through. They found uh, more bones, they found charred flesh, but nothing that resembled a human. And it wasn't until they found Tylee's skull that they went, yes, for sure, 100%, this is human remains. He talked about the melted green bucket. He talked about how the remains, what was left of them didn't look human because again, he was dismembered and burned. We know that. Um, but they were kind of pulled together and kind of stacked he, he described it as a pedestal type shape that were buried and they tried to dig around it and maintain that shape and then tried to pull out everything all together to maintain that shape and then just all fell apart so they again and they took pictures at every step of the process which was so awesome because there was only so much cross the prior could do to try to poke holes because there's photographic evidence of every step they take what they can put them into multiple bags but then he says that we had the anthropologist on the team. And I thought, oh, I hadn't thought of that, but it makes sense that you would have an anthropologist on your team. Awesome. Went through and helped them determine that yes, these are human remains. Everything you've gathered here looks like potential human remains and um, tried to make sure they had gathered everything that could be. And there's elements like this could be fabric. This could be, the, but it's things that have been in the ground for months and months. It's hard to know for sure without testing. And so they gathered everything they thought would be relevant, put them in bags, bagged them, sealed them. And those were then sent off for autopsy. They also showed a charm from a necklace that they someone noticed that was on the ground. It wasn't buried. I think it was overlooked. Pryor tried to make it sound like 
it was just out in the open and anyone could have seen it walking by. And I'm thinking probably only FBI specialists who are trained in body recovery would notice something. It was probably in the grass and Chad probably, and Alex, whoever was then doing the burying, probably didn't notice it themselves. But they showed pictures of Tylee wearing this exact same pendant and they showed pictures of the pendant as well. Um, I believe they also showed pictures of some of the excavation of the remains. They did not show that to the public for obvious reasons. And then they also took into custody a pick from the garage that had uh, charred marks and some debris and also a shovel, things that they thought might have been used in burying the human remains. Last little thing about uh, Special Agent Daniels' testimony that I found of note was how um, prosecutor Rob Wood would actually ask the questions. He said, instead of saying, what does this photograph show? He would say, what does the jury see here? And I thought that was a brilliant way to phrase it. Nothing the prior can object to, but it makes it more personal. What is the jury seeing? They're the ones who have to make a determination. That was essentially that. And then Heather Daybell. Heather Daybell's testimony, again, was huge and amazing. And you need to go listen to it. But that was day 16 in a nutshell. Day 17, um, and this is a, a one of the few days where I have I have timestamps if you want to look at the East Idaho News feed where you can jump ahead to parts. Um, I will do timestamps if I'm watching after court is done for the day. Here's the timestamps from the East Idaho News feed. The day begins at 26 minutes in where we continue um, Special Agent Daniel's testimony. And then we had Melanie Pulowski and then her, um, her husband, Ian Pulowski, which were fantastic. Priors trying to claim shoddy police work, blah, blah, blah. No, um, I mentioned some of that already, which was actually on um, day 17, not 16, but you know, my brain was going into the, the entire testimony. Prior got stuck on the whole, does the Daybell property house have stairs? Which as you know, has been an ongoing question when he tried to do a gotcha with one of, uh, it was Tammy's cousin's daughter, Hannah, on the stand uh, earlier in the week. Because she'd never been there, but she said something along the lines of Tammy going up or down the stairs the night she died. And so he's like, oh, the house is only one story. Gotcha. And now ever since we've had testimony about an addition to the house that actually does have a second story. There are stairs. And here's the other fun part. Um, Pryor is trying to make it sound like well, it's not really part of the house. It's part of the garage because it's built onto the back of the garage is from what I understand. I don't think the technicality matters as far as Hannah's testimony. Pryor's like, well, it's not a bedroom though. It's, it's just this thing off the garage. And then I love Daniels put him in his place. He said, I called it a, a bedroom because it had a bed in it. There was a mattress and a comforter that was open and it appeared it had been used recently. It looked like a bedroom that someone was sleeping in. <laughs> Boom! He also, Daniels, showed pictures from, of the property from that, from the window that is in that bedroom, loft, whatever you want to call it. And those pictures showed that, that window where we're pretty sure Chad did a, did a lot of his work up there as a little office loft for himself and also probably was sleeping there. There seems to be evidence that he slept there often. Um, that's where he was sleeping when the police came to do the warrant and find the children on the house. And it seems like he slept there a lot. So it wouldn't surprise me if Tammy was basically saying, you're not sleeping in my bed. You're having an affair. I know this before she died. That's my opinion. But from that window, you can see the the graves, both of them, of Tylee and JJ. From that window. Maybe that's another reason why he wanted to be there. Because it, it's almost like a creepy trophy aspect. It just gross. After Daniels testified, we had Melanie Pulowski. She is the second Melanie in the case. The first one being Melanie Gibb. Um, you can tell which they're talking about if someone spelling it correctly because the niece Melanie has no E at the end of her name. She goes by Melanie Pulowski or um, Melanie Boudreau. 
and then her maiden name before she, either of her first two marriages was Melanie Cox. She is Lori's niece. Her mother died, as I've mentioned before, her mother died when she was very young. Her mother, Stacy, is Lori's sister. Um, she died rather young from complications to diabetes and some other things. There are some signs that there could be some questionable circumstances around her death. Essentially, Stacy dies. Melanie is her daughter. She's very young. I don't know if Melanie even has memories of her mother because she was so young. So Lori became a mother figure to her. And when Lori, if you've watched my last video, you know Lori sometimes would say she had seven children. And that was referring to seven children she and Chad had supposedly had in past lives. And she listed Melanie as one of those seven. Not her own children, or at least not Colby or entirely. JJ was on the list. Melanie Pulaski uh, bought in to this whole Chad Lori cult crap. And her ex-husband, Brandon, already testified in the case, in the trial so far. He was the one that Alex tried to shoot and kill and failed, fortunately. Um, and Lori is in, in jail in Arizona awaiting trial on his attempted murder and on Charles's murder. After that divorce, the divorce was largely because of, of Lori and Chad's crazy talk. And um, Melanie, it sounds like she, she just bought in. Suddenly she was very involved, like overly religious, whereas before she had been kind of a lukewarm religious person. She'd go to church most of the time and that, and then suddenly she's like fringy, orthodoxy, whatever, weird level of, you know, of intense. She remarried very quickly to Ian Pulowski. They married, I believe it was, it was in November of 2019 after an 11 day courtship. Get into more of that in just a second. But Melanie testified that Lori and Chad, who she started calling mom and dad, uh, were giving her advice and counsel and often together, or Lori would relay a message from Chad, or she would say, hey, Lori, would you ask Chad, blah, blah, blah. And he was their fount of wisdom for all things. There was a point where they told her, don't trust Detectives Hermosillo or Cope of the Rexburg Police Department. They have gone dark and that they are on Satan's side and blah, blah, blah. Um, apparently at one point, Detective Hermosillo offered Melanie Pulaski some banana bread and she was like, oh my goodness, I wonder if it's poison. No. So Melanie visited Rexburg in late September. She was still living in Arizona at that point. Um, and then she went to Hawaii with Lori. And then also, this is in October of 2019, when she also went to Missouri before she moved up to Rexburg in November, at which point she married Ian Pulaski. So apparently Alex was supposed to come with them to Hawaii. And then at the last minute he said, no, I can't go. Chad needs help with something. Yeah, um, that was late September. And we know now that something was probably burying Tylee. The children are missing. That's all we know at this point. That and that Chad and Lori are married and Tammy is now dead. Things are weird. Charles is dead, but we don't know that they are directly involved with the children's disappearance or that the children are dead. Chad and Lori have fled. At this point, Melanie doesn't know where they are. They're like, oh, well, we had to flee for our safety. Now we know they were in Hawaii at this time, but um, they're telling Melanie, don't talk to the police again. They're evil, they're dark, they're bad. And then they're like, oh, well, you need to go somewhere else. And she goes, but you told me Rexburg is the place of light. This is where all the, the protection will be when the second coming happens. And Chad's like, well, yeah, but there's also prophecies of like some other bad stuff in Rexburg, like some, like, you know, fights break out around McDonald's and whatnot. Like he's making up crap on the fly. I'm trying to explain why moving to Rexburg she still needed to, but now get out. And it's just, it's just temporary. And then she says, well, if it's just temporary. You know, Ian and I can go into an Airbnb for a couple weeks. And he goes, no, 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 no. You need to go to go get an, another apartment. Detective Hermosillo, she says it was just so angry. And, and he won't stop until he gets what he wants. And she makes it sound nefarious and very scary. And I'm thinking, no, Detective Hermosillo was a hero for us because he wouldn't stop until he found the children. 
and now he won't stop until those who are responsible for their deaths are put behind bars for life. So good job, Detective Hermosillo. On Cross, Pryor brings up something that we've heard several times already. And I was like, oh, dude, why are you, I don't know what this thing is you think you're, you're bringing up and nobody knows about it. He asks Melanie Pulaski, what are the Seven Gatherers, this organization? And she has no clue what he's talking about. Just as Melanie Gibb had no idea, just as David Warwick had no idea. He's brought this up at least three times now. And everyone's like, I don't know what you're talking about, dude. So a little hint, we actually find out, I believe on day 18, when Zulema testified. We'll get to that. Um, I will say people were like, oh my gosh, Melanie Pulowski and Melanie Gibb totally perjured themselves. I don't think so. I don't think they did. Um, even though Zulema said that they were part of the Seven Gatherers thing, I'll explain in my next video. Um, then we get Ian Pulowski. He gets up there as, you know, Melanie's new husband. Um, it's a second marriage for them both. On their honeymoon, she, Melanie starts telling them some creepy things and Ian's like this does not sound like a good thing and Melanie's like you can't tell anyone my whole my name my whole name don't tell anybody because they're trying to kill me and this and that and um Ian's ex-wife Natalie it sounds like they had not had contact since the divorce it was an ugly divorce with them too but Natalie reached out and said I need to know this woman you just suddenly met and married very quickly what is her name I need to look her up so Ian caved and said this her name is Melanie Boudreaux um so his ex-wife Natalie looks her up and flips out recognizing this is the niece of Lori Vallow whose children are missing finds out that her ex Brandon was shot at in an attempted murder Charles is dead all of these crazy things and of course she's like um ex-husband dude you just married into the psycho family our children could be at risk this is scary and he's like, oh, you're right. And there was a moment on their honeymoon and one of his daughters was briefly missing. She was just playing like hide and seek, but the moment freaked him out so bad. He's like, okay, I've got to go talk to the cops. So he wrote this long statement. Nate Eaton read a good chunk of it on his broadcast. I'll bring up some later on in a different video, but essentially saying, I am very concerned and here is why. And then the FBI asked him basically to wear a wire and record conversations and phone calls with Lori and Chad. And he made nine recordings and they played excerpts in court, which was fantastic to actually hear Chad and Lori talking about these crazy things. At one point in the recordings, it says that Alex says, oh, there's nothing, he, Alex didn't want to move to Rexburg from Arizona. And if you know that the climate, like Arizona is hot desert and then Rexburg is like freezing ice cold and very windy. So he didn't want to go to Rexburg and they eventually convinced him to. He said, well, there's, there's, there's nothing left to do in Rexburg. Let that sink in for just a second because he apparently thought he had missions to do in Rexburg and they were successful and he done, they're done. There's nothing left to do in Rexburg. Chad's response on the recording is, yeah, Al, you know better. That's scary. At one point also on the recording, I couldn't hear it completely clearly, but it's, this is what it sounded like to me. If you listen to it, let me know if you heard this as well. When Chad is saying he and Lori had to flee, and he's, he's telling Melanie Pulowski that the police are coming for you, you need to flee. And note, he thinks, if he thinks Melanie's life is in danger, he's doing nothing to protect her. He's just saying, go away out of Rexburg to save his own butt. We know that now. But he said something to the effect of, kind of like, I had to flee Jerusalem. That's what I heard. And I was like, wait, what? And so I'm wondering if he w was thinking that Rexburg is be going to become the, the new Jerusalem, like the, when Christ comes, if that's what he was referring to, fleeing Rexburg. Or is he referring to a past life when he had to flee the actual city of Jerusalem and the Holy Land? Either way, weird. It just seemed odd to me. Ian then goes on to talk about they would receive blessings from Chad and Lori through Zoom. Like priesthood blessings. And he said that was weird. One of the the blessings was played in court. And it, it, yeah, it was creepy and frankly offensive. It was, we lay our hands upon your head from Hawaii via Zoom. Like, that's a common phrasing at the beginning of LDS blessings. You lay our hands upon your head, whatever. But it's actually physically happening. 
you don't do this via Zoom. Like, no. A good chunk of the blessing sounded more like a prayer than a blessing. It's talked about how that you'll be away from your kids a lot, but it's important because you'll be helping people gather for, for months at a time for the coming of Christ. It's okay, but you'll be away from your kids. So he's kind of like preparing for that, which grosses me out. Then he actually said that Anne and Melanie will be an example to thousands and even millions of how a husband and a wife should love each other. Like, um, Chad, what would you know about treating a wife well? Just, just a question. He says there's a choir of thousands singing their praises in heaven, make, and they're making up songs as they go. And people start laughing. But why are you laughing? If you think this is a real blessing, this is a real spiritual moment, why are you laughing at it? That seems bizarre to me, but whatever. Then Chad says he, that he blesses, quote, all of us. The phrasing it sounds more like a, like, like a prayer, like, please bless all of us, that this, da, 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 whatever. But one big element of Latter-day Saint priesthood blessings is that you can only give them to somebody else. You cannot give them to yourself. It is a service. It is something you give. Again, in theory, hopefully you're being inspired by the spirit, but you don't bless yourself. So he's actually blessing all of us. I'm like that. No, that might be a prayer. That's not a blessing. He also called the police in Rexburg, the telestial police force, meaning basically that's the biggest insult he can give to people because it's the lowest level of glory in the next life, which in his mind is hell or something, which we don't believe in, but whatever. He told the Ian and Melanie that the, their, um, a way will be opened for them to unleash their powers more fully, whatever the creepiness that means, and that they will be able to continue. And this is actually saying us. So not just Ian and Melanie, but also Chad and Lori, the, the four of them, will be able to continue to cleanse the earth. Not just cleanse the earth, but to continue to cleanse it. Killing Charles and Tylee and JJ and attempting to kill Brandon, whatever, Tammy, in their minds that was cleansing. They've already done some cleansing and we will continue to. He also said that there will be a big earthquake in Utah and that um, the church leaders knew this, which is why they set up an infrastructure around the Rexburg area so that it could be a second headquarters, like a backup headquarters to the church. Apparently he points to some like a big meeting amphitheater kind of thing as proof of that. It's just part of the Rexburg campus. It might even be like the BYU Marriott Center in Provo where it's, that's where the basketball games and graduation ceremonies are held. It's just a big, it's like, a, it's an arena. It's a basketball arena. Like, but somehow Chad liked to point to that as evidence of the church had plans for a second headquarters. And yet in the same breath, the, the church leaders are fallen and bad and evil. He likes to use the church leaders as proof of his goodness when it's convenient, but also claim that they're bad and fallen. They're inspired enough to create the second headquarters. Well, they didn't, according to Chad. But he also says that the, the church leaders are all zombies. So which is it? This is Lori now, I believe. She referring to M Melanie Gibb as a terrestrial being. So she has elevated herself to the telestial. She's a higher level being. And so either she's being translated, she's in the process of being translated, or she is translated, which is, no. So if I mentioned this on a previous video because the, the term keeps coming up, but being translated in LDS jargon is when, if your body is, is changed, um, so you're temporarily immortal, essentially, so you can live longer. Like John the Beloved in the New Testament asked Christ, can I stay until you return? He said yes. So the idea is that John the Beloved's body would have been translated so he won't die and that he will be here until Christ returns. So only a handful of people with a job to accomplish would be translated on earth. That's not something you aspire. That There's no need to be translated for most of us. Like what? But they're afraid that she's not going to cut her cords to David Warwick and he's still telestial and because David at this point had turned on some level been like, I don't appreciate your teachings. I don't believe them. I think you're going fringe. And they're like, okay, well, he must be dark. And Melanie, you need to put, you know, separate yourself from this guy and instead she's still married to him. Um, I have issues with Melanie and David Warwick separately, but um, at least they were right on this count. Lori says that she has telestial fear and that's why she's staying with David.
Ian says they got constant blessings every time they were met on Zoom. Um, and Lori would be part of giving blessings. But again, it sounds more like she's writing a letter to her children, a loving letter, ironically, to her own children rather than giving them a blessing. It doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like a blessing, let's put it that way. And she would know what blessings sound like. And Chad basically says, and now she will be joining in. He calls her Lily. That's another one of her extra names. Lily will now continue the blessing. And in that particular call, Chad and Lori refer to themselves as mom and dad, as well as um, Melanie Pulaski calling them that. There's also reference to Cain's 12 translated disciples. There's no, we have no teaching about, so Cain and Abel, so Cain being the one who killed Abel, the first murder in biblical history, sons of Adam and Eve. There's some belief that there's this curse of Cain and whatever that, there's so many different possible interpretations. I don't think there's one that is considered correct or the one we believe. Um, but there's definitely nothing about Cain having 12 disciples like Christ had 12 apostles, let alone that there's a dark version of being translated. But apparently Chad and Lori believed that there are 12 translated evil disciples of Cain and they are somehow in Rexburg. Number one, evil people don't get translated, period. Um, but also another thing that's bizarre to me is that Lori believes that these translated evil disciples of Cain were negotiating eternal laws or that Lucifer was no negotiating with them. And I, no. In fact, we believe that eternal laws are real and it's not something we can negotiate that even God is bound by eternal law. Like the, the law of gravity is just, it, it is, it's not something that can, you can negotiate. So, and why Lucifer could negotiate? Why would God negotiate with Lucifer? Are you kidding me? No, no, it's bizarre. Chad and Lori continue to freak out Melanie, thinking that she's in, in dire, urgent danger to get out of Rexburg. Then Leah, uh, Lori also goes off about how Ian and Melanie will be caring for children. This is, of course, after Chad has said that they will be separated from their own children for months. Um, but they will be able to take care of all of these children. And then Lori starts to cry. And I thought, whoa, number one, I don't think I've ever heard Lori emotional, showing sadness, tears, anything. That's a new one. Second, this is after her own children are dead. And she had a part in that. It goes right back to when Chad was giving the patriarchal blessing to Alex and started crying over the idea of helping children as well. This is in that same few week period. We also hear in the recordings, um, like Tammy was here the other day and I said, oh, was it, isn't the Rexburg Police Department ridiculous? And she was just laughing and agreeing with me. I just wanna go keep the dead woman's name out of your mouth, Lori. Don't, don't, don't you dare speak Tammy's name and pretend you're friends. We also learned that they had secret phrases that they would use when they got a new burner phone or Lori and Chad did so that they would be like, oh, is this phone being tracked by the cops? We don't know, is it safe? And so they have these little code words they would be using. And it also sounded like, <laughs> poor Melanie. I mean, I think she was, she's done a lot of wrong things, but she was very dependent on Chad and Lori and they kind of fed that. And then when they fled to Hawaii and were changing burner phones and all this, she had no way to contact them. So she had to wait for them to reach out to her and that left her feeling very vulnerable and, and very scared and understandably so. They also discuss how Lori and Chad had no desire for any of Alex's possessions because this is after Alex had died. I'll oh, just throw it away, donate it, um, whatever. Um, and then Melanie says that she doesn't want her ex-husband Brandon to know that Alex is dead because she wants him to be afraid for the rest of his life. And then she laughs. And that, that sounded a little bit evil to me. They also think that Alex will continue to be attacking Brandon from the other side and that Alex will be their protector from the other side. And he's, his mission on, on Earth um, was finished after he managed to get Lori and Melanie Pulaski to find their new protectors in Chad and Ian Pulaski. And then he could die now that they had their new husbands to protect them. At one point, Ian did say he does not believe that Melanie had anything to do with Alex trying to kill Brandon, that she didn't even know about it. I have a hard time believing that because when Brandon went into hiding in Utah, he fled Arizona, 
went many hours to Utah with his kids. Um, she at his parents' house. She trespassed two days in a row. Tried to bear, break down their 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 door from their garage into the interior, and Brandon's father called the cops. And she was arrested on trespassing with enhanced domestic violence charges. They were terrified because Brandon had nearly been killed. If she was so innocent in all of that, why was she hunting him down instead of saying, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. That is, I don't know what happened. And why isn't she going into hiding or whatever? It just seems odd that her reaction would be to hunt Brandon down at that point. And then she's going up to Idaho without her kids, or it sounds like she wasn't at that point trying to get custody. I don't know. It's just messed up. So Melanie says she can't wait to be sealed to Ian and that, and then and to have Breezy and Braxton sealed to them as well. That's just struck me as a little odd. I was like, well, who are Breezy and Braxton? I thought, well, maybe they're some of Ian's kids. Um, but when you, you're dealing with divorces and second marriages, who the kids get sealed to, it gets messy. And if you watch one of my, my the other videos I've made, I'll try to remember to link to it, getting up here, um, talking about some of the, the terminology and doctrines, especially like sealings. You can't just randomly seal kids to random parents. So I don't know how she thought she could seal two of her daughters to Ian when she had them with Brandon. And they're still sealed to those parents. Even if Melanie and Brandon's sealing is broken, in theory, those children still get blessings having been sealed to parents. And this is one of those things you can try to ask me, but I don't, we don't really have answers either. Our, the, the doctrines and haven't been explained to that extent. It's, and, and honestly, I feel like it doesn't really matter that God will make it right in the end. But it is weird for her to say that. Here's the, the disturbing part though. Breezy and Braxton are still alive. They are Melanie Pulaski's daughters. But Chad has said they were dark. So, and when she says that Breezy and Braxton will be with Alex, I think she is, is th thinking because Chad listed her daughters as dark, they will be dying soon because dark people, zombies have to die. And then once they're on the other side, Alex can take care of them. And that was disturbing as well. Um, one thing that I wanted to bring up too, this not this is a very Latter-day Saint thing, but not, not doctrine per se or whatever. It's very uncommon for Latter-day Saints to be cremated. It's not against the rules, um, but just culturally the respect of the body and if possible, you want, you're buried and then you're, you're, you're buried in, in your ceremonial clothing if you've um, been through the temple for your, your own endowment. But while cremation is not against beliefs, it is unusual. And so you would think people who are more devout and pro professing to be extra righteous would not be opting for cremation. And yet Alex and Charles were both cremated on family's request, which especially in the case of Alex is to me, that is a red flag because not only is it culturally an interesting an un unusual decision, but I think in, in the context of Chad and Tammy and then being exhumed and having an autopsy and oh, she was killed. Let's just make sure that Alex can't be exhumed. I think that I personally believe that that's why Alex was cremated. Like Tammy was not cremated. Tammy was buried. And I think if Chad had thought that she would be exhumed, he would have had her cremated. So on a cross, um, prior starts going off on Anne. Well, let's, let's be, let's be frank. The, an 11 day courtship is not that uncommon among Latter-day Saints. And just to be clear, yes, Latter-day Saints tend to have shorter courtships, but 11 days is lightning fast, even for us. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> 11 days. I'm sure that people going, are you out of your ever loving mind? Like, no, 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 no. 11 days is whoosh. No, that, uh, that'd be raising red flags for most people, even within Mormon land. Ian said he believed that Alex was not a protector. If he wanted what was best for Melanie, he would not have shot at her ex-husband, Brandon. And I wanted to go, yeah, you're absolutely right. Then we had a moment where the court was just er, screeched, came to a halt. All of a sudden, turns out that Ian's lawyer, he was in, in, in the gallery and either Judge Boyce or someone on his staff thought they saw the, his lawyer nodding to Ian or somehow trying to communicate with him during his testimony, which is not allowed. 
Um, and so he was escorted out of the room and then the trial went on. He was let in the next day when Zulema testified and is, he is her lawyer as well. He made a statement to Nate Eaton at East Idaho News saying that he was not trying to communicate with Ian or do anything wrong. Ian actually on, on the stand said no, there was no communication. So I don't know if he was just nodding to himself as he took notes or, or what. Pryor says some ridiculous things. He asks Ian, did Chad ever discuss plans to murder the children? And then Ian's response was, well, that would have been foolish. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, Chad's not the brightest bulb, but even he knows not uh, to to say vocally. Pryor says, are you familiar with the fundamental Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? And his objection sustained because there was a brand new element. You can't bring up brand new things in cross. When it came to the seven gatherers thing, oh, y'all want to watch that video. That's that's coming up next. But um, I think the prosecution knows when to um, ob object. And that was one where, what does the FLDS have to do with anything? That literally has nothing to do with this case. Um, he wants to bring it up on his own case in chief party on, but that's not uh, something you bring up on cross. He also talks about how Alex died of pulmonary edema. I was like, no, the autopsy said pulmonary embolism, not the same thing as edema, but edema is also a descriptor, not a singular noun. You can't count edema. And he, he referred to it as he died of a pulmonary edema. No. That, that's not how that works. Like, we need to give the man a lesson on count nouns and non-count nouns. I, th I think that Alex um, did not die of a pulmonary embolism. And there's some interesting questions there because he went to Mexico for a day trip the day before he died. Likely got some medications. That was probably his reason for going is what Zulema later testifies to. And he dies the next day. So I've been trying to do a little bit of digging to figure out is there anything that he could have bought that could have taken his own life because he knew he was being set up as a fall guy. It was the day after Tammy was exhumed and that was the, also the day after he told Zulema, I think I'm being turned into their fall guy and that if I am either a man of God or I am not. So I think he probably took his own life because he was freaked out. And if he hadn't taken his own life, this again, my opinion, we can't know for sure because again, autopsy said one thing and then he was cremated um but if he hadn't done it himself he probably saw the writing on the wall and knew that he would be conveniently turned dark and then he would be taken out one thing to know if you're watching the feed prior oh he's so annoying on so many levels but when his voice gets soft and kind of high-pitched you know he's trying to um do a gotcha situation or he's you can tell that he's really annoyed by a response because someone will say something and he'll go oh okay when he he says oh okay you know he that's not the answer he was hoping to get and it's kind of hilarious um we found out that after the afternoon break um that julie Rowe apparently tried to get into the courtroom and the bailiff she, it sounds like she was in disguise with a hoodie and hat and sunglasses and she tried to sneak in ahead of Kay and Larry Woodcock who were the last ones that were going to be in and the bailiff stopped her and said you're on the witness list you can't come in and then let in like Kay and Larry and then closed the door. Yeah. Why would Julie try to do that? She's been brought up several times in the trial already. She is the author for those who don't know of Chad's first really big selling book with his publishing company. Um, about her own supposed near-death experience and she still teaches classes about learning how to create portals and have your own visions and blah -de blah um, The church came out very quickly when that book came out and said, do not teach anything from this book. This is not what we believe. We do not endorse this. She retrenched. She was excommunicated. She has been on Chad's side. She was until the children were found. She kept saying she had visions and knew Chad was innocent. And then now she's walked that back. Sounds like she had an affair with Chad, though now she's accusing him of S.A. I wouldn't surprise me if both are true, honestly. But um, she, she's, she is a, she's a piece of work. I think she has lied and done a lot of manipulations of her own. I also think she may have seen things and believed them 
because she also has schizophrenia and will not to medicate for it. So if you know you have schizophrenia and I have a dear friend who does, um, until your symptoms and your, your condition is under control, you can't be telling people you're seeing visions and messages from heaven because you don't know what's real and what is not. So I don't trust Julie Rowe any farther than I can throw her. Two last little fun things. One is that uh, Tammy's aunt Vicky has been watching Chad and says that he has a tell. That anytime he, there is a witness saying something that is very uh, damning and may concern him, um, he seems to see suddenly on his laptop and he seems to be scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. So that's kind of a tell. He seemed, when he seems stressed out, he's scrolling. So I'll have to watch for that. Although it's hard to see that from the angle of the camera that we get as streaming public. Um, and then another thing as a question I've seen uh, many people posing is that why are people calling her Lori Vallow when she was already married to Chad when she was arrested? And there's a few reasons for that. One is that Pryor wants to distance her from Chad, not calling her Daybell. Um, but I would also say that when these crimes were committed, she was Vallow. Um, but another element is she hadn't changed her name legally as far as we know. Getting married doesn't automatically change the name. It's the 21st century, guys. Like, there was talk of Alex potentially wanting to change his name to Zalema's last name. Um, maybe to hide his identity, but to take on her name as Pestenis. So why wasn't, isn't Alex referred to as Pestenis? He had already married Zulema when he died. Um, why isn't Melanie Gibb referred to as Melanie Warwick? Because she hasn't changed her name and she's still Melanie Gibb. Like, that, guys, there's, <laughs> whatever Pryor's reasons, she probably was still Lori Vallow. She hadn't gone through the multi-step process it takes to change her name legally. She was still Lori Vallow. So I don't know why people are throwing such a fit over not calling her Lori Daybell. I don't know if she had changed her name to that. If she hadn't, then that wasn't her name and isn't her name. It's, it's been an intense month. Lori's jury selection began on April 1st, so did Chad's. Lori's verdict came the second weekend of May. And we're approaching that now, but we're nowhere near a verdict. I remember I was actually at a writing conference when the verdict came down and I ran into a friend. Did you hear? Did you hear? And she's like, oh my gosh, yes, because she, she knew Chad. She had actually been rejected by Tammy in the past. Um, yeah, it could, it, this case has really affected the writing industry and especially among Latter-day Saints. So it's not a surprise to me that would have a lot of writers interested. So that conference is coming up again this weekend. I'll be there and so I will be trying to keep up on the trial and keep posting here, but we'll see how crazy that gets. So, as I always as I said it lots of times, but you know, we've got a lot of better. Go find yourself something sweet.